Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We are uh, glad that you are here with us in worship this morning. Uh, it's a great day to worship the Lord. A couple of announcements as we begin our service today. This week is Bible school. Uh, that starts off tomorrow night at 6.30. Uh, we are looking forward to it. You can see some decorations around the church and uh, been praying for it. So you join us. Pray with us uh, that our Bible school will be a great opportunity to point boys and girls toward Jesus. Uh, so and continue to pray. This week, that will be from 6.30 to 8.45 each night. Meals will be provided as well. Uh, so invite children, grandchildren, neighbors, uh, anybody that you know. Uh, send them our way and we would love to share with them this week your vacation Bible school. You'll notice in the in the announcement sheet bulletin, if you didn't get one, they're on the table right there in the foyer. Uh, be sure to grab one when you go out. But in that, that bulletin announcement sheet, uh, there's a motion from the ALC uh, to replace some, some cracked windows around the, the property. That had been introduced a few weeks ago. Uh, there are details there on that motion uh, coming from the ALC. And that will be voted on next Sunday. All right, so you'll have an opportunity next week to ask questions or clarify anything uh, if you need to. Just to make you aware that that's going to be going on at the, the end of service next Sunday morning. Also, deacons, uh, get ready to throw you a third call. Mike wants to meet with you all uh, just here at the front after service briefly, uh, just for a couple of minutes to touch base um, and, and just handle uh, one thing that we need to handle. All right. So, I'd like to read to you from Psalm chapter 113. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord, praise O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. So that's three times in one verse. That he tells us to praise the Lord. I think he uh, has a, a message that he's wanting to get across and convey. He continues on in verse 2 and says, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. I'm glad that we have an opportunity to praise and worship the Lord together today. Uh, let's, let's pray right now and ask God to direct our hearts and our focus on Him in these coming moments and that we would worship Him and give Him the honor and praise that He is He alone is worthy of. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank You so very much for the opportunity to worship You today with brothers and sisters in Christ. God, as we meet and gather together, life is busy. There's a lot going on. This week with Bible school and, and so many various things. But God, I pray that You would help us in these moments to hit pause on all the rest of life, Lord, and to seek your face and to worship you and to praise you. That, God, you would meet with us here today and speak into the hearts and lives of men and women and boys and girls. So, God, I ask that as we do sing, as we pray, as we give, as we spend time in your word, God, I pray that Christ would be exalted, that you would be glorified, and that the Holy Spirit would speak and move. God, we give you all of the credit and the glory for everything that you're going to do, even in advance before you do it. God, we love you. We stand and proclaim and declare that today. Lead and guide in our service. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Get your hymn books, turn to page 470, and we're going to be seeing the first, second, and the last verse. Let's all stand together, please.
Took it to advance. They, they hooked it up. The battery, the alternator, the starter are all good to go. So I think that uh, God is wanting to use my vehicle to teach me lessons. <laughs> all right. So uh, I, you heard the front part of that story last week, but as Paul Harvey would say, I want to give you the rest of the story to let you know that I went home and my car did start. <laughs> We work into chapter 6 today. We see uh, so far through the book of Acts, as we've looked at the early church, there's been tremendous growth through the early church. And it's just been a matter of weeks since, you know, uh, Christ's ascension. Then after that, uh, the Holy Spirit came, all right? And, and the apostles are preaching and teaching and, and the church is being the church. And I mean, it's exponential growth. I want to read to you just a couple of verses. You don't have to turn to these, but I just want to read them to you uh, to, to set our minds on the growth of the early church. Acts 2.41, it says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Acts 2.47, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 4.4, 4, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. They have Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. All right, by the time we get to Acts 4 4, just the men, without women and children or youth, all right, 5,000. Acts 5 14, it says, And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So, within the matter of just a few weeks, the church had gone from a group of, you know, maybe a hundred or so. Uh, disciples, believers, to where now it's estimated that it's probably around 20,000 people that, that had trusted in Jesus Christ uh, and, and made up the early church. When the church was growing, Satan didn't like it. The enemy tried to, he tried to stir the pot and uh, throw things in the way to, to hinder and dampen the church's effectiveness. Uh, we know that he sent persecution you know, as, as the apostles preached and taught and shared about Jesus, they were called in front of a religious council that told them not to talk about Jesus anymore, not to even mention his name. And then they were beaten. All right. They had been imprisoned. So they faced persecution. But you know what? The gospel kept going on. The church continued to be faithful and effective. We see another example of Satan trying to trying to throw a roadblock in their way with sin. With Ananias and Sapphira, as they were deceitful. But you know what? 
God dealt with that sin and it had a purifying effect on the church to where believers were authentic and they were genuine and the church continued to grow. So as, as the enemy of Satan has tried to bring persecution and sin uh, into the church, he hasn't succeeded. Uh, the church has continued to be faithful and push, push forward with the gospel. So today we're going to see he tries another route. Uh, the enemy tries uh, to bring difficulties and, and hard situations and circumstances into the church to hinder their witness. One aspect of the early church that was very unique was their unity. The harmony that the early church had. And we've seen it as we've worked through the book of Acts. Acts 1.14 it says, And these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. There was this community and unity and harmony where they were uh, living life together as the body of Christ. Acts 2.42, when they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Right? So this, this unity within the church, God worked in and through it. Acts 4.24, as, as Peter and John were released the first time that they spoke to the council, they came back and they gave a report to the rest of the believers. Uh, and then, this is their response. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and, and said, and prayed. So there was, there was that, that one heartbeat. And that's what Luke tells us in Acts 4.32. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. The enemy had tried to bring persecution. He tried to throw sin into the mix and stir the pot. And it hadn't been effective. The church was still unified with one heartbeat and one soul. And we know that that was to make Jesus Christ known. They cared for their community. They cared for others. They served others. But it was the advancement of the gospel and speaking the truth of Jesus Christ. And the relationship with God that was possible through trusting in Jesus Christ. So today we see that persecution hadn't worked, sin hadn't worked, so Satan pulls out the big guns. Alright, if you're in Acts chapter 6, if you would stand with me as we read our text, as we read God's Word today. Acts chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they had said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. God, I pray that today as we spend a few moments in your word that the early church would serve as a model, God, for us to follow, that we would uh, see how they confronted uh, the enemy and his deceitful tactics, Lord, uh, to try to throw a wrench in what God was doing in and through the early church. God, I pray that you would help us to, to weigh and evaluate ourselves in our own church. God, that we would submit ourselves to the word as we hear it, that we would be doers as well. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct and that you would be glorified for our time in your word today. In Christ's name I pray. So as, as we look at this text today, we're going to see that the early church is a model. 
Okay? Uh, the early church was not perfect. There was sin. All right? There were issues that they had. Uh, so, so don't set the early church up on a pedestal and say, hey, we need to be exactly like the early church. But we can take principles from the early church that definitely should be applied to our lives today as followers of Christ and to our church. So let the early church today, I pray that it would serve as a model in dealing with this conflict. So as we work through this passage, we're going to look at the problem. Then we're going to see the purpose and priorities of the early church. We're going to see a plan for shared ministry. And then we're going to see the power of God on display. But it all starts out with the problem. We see the problem that arises in verse 1. It says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So background to help us understand here, uh, they were all Jews. Okay, They were all uh, from the line of Abraham. But some of the Jews had moved away from uh, Jerusalem to other parts of the world uh, and, and had spread over time. So what you have here is, is Jews who reside and live in Jerusalem, all right, and then Jews that live outside. So you can imagine that there are differences in culture, in customs, even in language. All right, as, as the apostles, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and they preached, it says that, that these people gathered from all over, heard the word in their own tongue, their own native language. All right, so there were barriers within the early church between the, the Jews that, that lived there in Jerusalem or in Israel and then those that were scattered and lived abroad. All right, the Hellenists, that, that basically just means Greek-speaking Jews. Right, so we're still talking about Jews, but you've got Jews that spoke uh, Hebrew or, or Aramaic at that time, and then the Hellenists that spoke Greek. And they had very uh, different customs. Well, in that society, in that culture, the Jewish people, uh, as you see from the Old Testament, and then James tells us in the New Testament, that they were instructed to and took very seriously care for widows. All right, widows were, were kind of seen as, as outcasts in society and, and in a hard spot, especially if their kids had moved away or if they never had kids. Uh, you know, they were kind of left to fend for themselves and God had instructed His people, hey, when you see widows or others with need meet those needs, well, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, as they're looking at this daily food distribution, they're like, well, we're missing out. Hang on, our widows are not being taken care of. So this collection that took place daily, they would go around and either collect food or collect money to purchase food. And as they did, the church, they would distribute it to those who, who had need. All right? Well, the Hellenists, whether it's because of the culture or language or whatever, they felt like they were neglected. And they were like, well, they're taking care of their own Aramaic-speaking Widows more than they are our Greek speaking widows. So, do you know how they responded? It says they complained. They grumbled. They murmured. Complaining stirs up strife and discord. If there's unity, one of the quickest ways to throw a wrench and break unity is to take offense and start complaining. All right, complaining in nature, it, it, and, and especially with these people, you take your eyes off of God and trusting in God to where then you start looking around and instead of that vertical gaze, you look horizontal. And then uh, as you observe, these thoughts start to happen and take place saying, well, that's not fair. Well, that's not equal. Well, that's not right. And, and taking the, the gaze and focus off of God and placing it on self it's where complaining starts. When, when our eyes are on ourselves, they can't be on God. It can be something small that, that causes an issue. Okay, This was not small. I mean, it was a legitimate concern that they had. But even small things can, can cause issues. I remember as a kid, when we would go on family vacations, 
Uh, my dad would pack the car and, you know, everything would be piled in and all of the kids and everything else, whether we were going to the beach or the mountains or, or wherever we were traveling, a lot of times without fail, there would be so much stuff crammed in as we packed to where something would be leaned up against the window or it would rattle or vibrate, you know, and it just made a noise, right? Always without fail, my dad would be like, hey. What's that making a noise back there? Well, we're not sure, but we'll figure it out. You know, and, and you had to you had to investigate and figure out where that noise was and then uh, deal with that noise. I thought back then, I was like, man, what's the big deal? I, I mean, it's, it's not loud. It's not, you know, what's the issue? You can ask my kids. When we travel now and I'm in the car, hey, what's that noise? What is that? And it, it's just distracting enough, all right? It's not a big deal, but it's distracting enough to where it takes my focus off of the road and driving and still able to drive, but it, I mean, it's still there, all right? That was almost the idea and the thought right here of this complaining. This complaining arose, and, and you know, it may not have been a huge deal. It was, it was distracting. They may have tried to ignore it, you know, but... but it got to the point to where enough, enough was enough. So we think about complaining. Though. How many people in here complain? Usually, I don't. I don't ask people to raise your hands, but today I want you to. How many people in here complain? I don't really always raise my hands. Jamie knows this too. All right. When you when you complain about someone or a situation. Do you usually go to that person or that situation and address it with them? Or do you tend to go to somebody else and complain? I tend to go to somebody else. You know, it's easy to go and, and try to drum up support or, you know, find allies and, and find somebody on your side because we want to be miserable and we just, we want to, we want other people to realize it too. And that's the way the complaining works. So unity and harmony with complaining as, as recruiting and sharing and everything else takes place, it causes cracks and fractures within that unity. In churches, when complaining happens, a lot of times it's mishandled. Okay? I know some pastors that, that when there's complaining or they hear grumbling, because remember, most of the time when we complain or grumble, we don't go to the person that we have issue with. You know, we hear it uh, through the grapevine. When complaining happens, a lot of times pastors will dismiss it and just say, God, you know, it's not worth my time, it's not worth my effort, it's not worth my energy, you know, I'm just going to ignore it. Well, that's not the biblical principle that we get ready to see right here from the apostles and the, the early church leadership. All right, it shouldn't be dismissed. Complaining a lot of times leads to hurt feelings. In division in church today, when when complaints arise and they're not addressed, they're dismissed. You usually have one or two, one of two options. Okay, one is to say, okay, well, I'm going to take my ball and go to another church. All right, we all we all know people like that, and, and you know, I mean, that's uh, I would almost rather do that than this next uh, potential result that I'm getting ready to share. But you know. In the early church, they were the church. There was not a second Baptist church or, a, you know, over on the other side of town. I mean, they were the church. So they didn't have the option to, to pick up and leave, which we shouldn't do anyway. We shouldn't address it. But if you don't leave, a lot of times the next logical result with complaining is that you stay there and make as much noise and bring as much discomfort as possible. Okay? Uh, my kids are really good at that. Right? Whether they're complaining about when are we going to eat or can I do this or can I do that? You know, I mean, it's it's like on repeat over and over and over and over again. So where finally Jamie and I would just throw our hands up sometimes and think, oh my goodness. All right? That's what complaining potentially leads to here. But remember, these issues, this was a legitimate concern that they were concerned about. 
So the right way to deal with the problem, let's look and see how the apostles dealt with this issue and this problem in the early church. Verse 2, it says in the 12, that's the 12 apostles, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And then in verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. All right, the apostles did not dismiss the complaining. They became aware of it. They heard it. And they called people together and they said, okay, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. So they addressed it head on, first and foremost. But notice the response that they had, okay? The response that they had, we can read into and, and see that the text implies that as people complained, they came to the apostles and they said, hey, our Hellenistic, the, the Greek-speaking widows are not being taken care of. What are you going to do about it? You need to take time every day to make sure that our Greek widows uh, get their, their fair shake in the daily distribution of the food. All right? The implication was, hey, this is a problem and we expect you to fix it. Well, the apostles said, hey, it's not right that we should give up preaching and, and teaching, sharing the word of God in order to serve tables. All right, this can be a sticky issue sometimes in pastoral ministry and things like that. All right, um, every church I've interviewed with at some point asks, well, what are your thoughts or views on, on visitation or going to the hospital or things like that? You know, because I know some pastors that will use this text and say, well, I'm supposed to preach and pray and teach and other people are supposed to, to offer pastoral care. Well, I don't think that's biblical. That's not biblical at all. You know, I think the apostles cared for these ladies and you see it and then wanted to come up with a solution. All right. They, they saw the need and they wanted that need to be met. But they realized that they could not compromise on the purpose and priority that God had given them as apostles. And that was to be witnesses. Remember Acts 1 8. When the Holy Spirit comes, you'll have power to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. All right, so they recognized the importance, but they knew that, that they would neglect their main purpose and priority in speaking and sharing and proclaiming the word of God and calling those who are lost to salvation. All right? so, so the apostles found themselves in a little bit of a hard spot. But remember who, remember who brought this issue and this complaining into the mix? Right? It's sinful. It's from the enemy. Right? It's from Satan that's trying to throw a wrench in the early church and, and to mess up the early church's effectiveness. Satan knew that if the apostles didn't preach and teach the word, but were more concerned with the daily distribution of food, then the gospel would not go forth. All right? The Bible doesn't say the daily distribution of food has the power to change lives. But it says the gospel has the power to change lives. So they said, hey, we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. But we've got a solution. We have a plan. All right. Satan knew that if, if they spent their time distributing food, that they wouldn't be preaching and praying. But this care for the widows was absolutely important. They didn't blow it off. They addressed it. Let's see the plan that they come up with in verse 3. The apostles say, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So we've seen the problem that arose, right? It was complaining, unfair treatment. We see that, that the apostles, they maintained their purpose and priority, right? Yes, to care for others, but look, to proclaim the gospel. And they come up with a plan. And this is a plan for shared ministry. They saw that, that this plan would enable them to preach and to pray. Some would say, well, they're just lazy. They just don't want to do it. They're trying to get out of it. But that wasn't the case at all. They were trying to be faithful to what God had called them to be faithful to. So the apostles, they empowered these seven men to serve. Uh, the word for deacon is not used in this text, okay? Um, 
a lot of times uh, you'll see seven chosen to serve or, you know, the first deacons or things like that. Right? This is where we get our biblical model of a deacon. That word is not used here, but there are some foundational principles that definitely have crossover and should apply. Because the word deacon, anybody know what the word deacon means? It means servant, to serve. All right? So with the foundational principles that are laid right here in this text, we see even now a reflection of deacons within the church. Notice the requirements for choosing these seven men. So that they should be of good repute. They should have a good name. All right? They should be men of integrity. All right? To where your yes is yes and your no is no. To where your, your talk and your walk align, hopefully, with your faith. All right? There's consistency there. That's the first ingredient. It says find seven men of good repute who have a good name, who have a good reputation, who are well respected. The second criteria that's given is that they're full of the Spirit. Remember the word for Spirit, the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of God is from the word pneuma in the Greek, which basically means breath. All right? It says find seven men that are full of the breath of God. And as I was thinking about that this week, I, I was blown away. I had to ask myself, am I full of the Spirit? Am I full of the breath of God? Is it fresh and new? You know, that was a requirement to look for uh, in these men to serve. The next requirement was, was to have wisdom, to be level-headed and mature. But notice it doesn't say smart, all right? It doesn't say uh, full of wisdom and intellect, or full of the spirit and intellect. It says full of the spirit and wisdom. Wisdom comes from walking with God, from spending time with Him and spending time in His Word. So the criteria is laid out right here for these men who are called to serve. Right here at Bethel, uh, in the past weeks, we've taken deacon nominations all right, uh, we've narrowed those down. We're going to present some names to you uh, for election to be voted on uh, coming up in a few weeks. I want to challenge and encourage you before that day comes. All right. Right here in this text, we can look toward men of good repute. Men who are full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, full of God's breath. They're full of wisdom, not smart, but wise. From following God and spending time with Him. I want to challenge you in these coming weeks to pray. Because these men who are called to serve, they have a vital role and a vital impact on the advancement of the gospel within the church. And they do it at our church as well. All right, this passage serves as a timely reminder of the seriousness in selecting leadership to share in ministry. I'm thankful for the deacons that we have here in church. I'm thankful for the deacon ministry that we have because it's not a board of directors. It's not a decision-making council that, you know, is, is laying down the law. One of the few churches that I've served at, Bethel, the deacons are about ministry and about service. And that's the biblical model. They were, they were called to serve. Let that be an encouragement to you to continue to pray as we continue on through uh, this process. Those partners in ministry, this shared ministry, can either be the greatest blessing or a terrible detriment to the church fulfilling its call to be a faithful witness and prioritizing the gospel. I urge you to pray. So we see they had a problem. They, they stated their purpose and priorities and they weren't willing to compromise on those things in the advancement of the gospel, but they came up with a plan of shared ministry. We see what happens. Verse 5 and 6 says, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And then it gives a list of seven names. 
that were, were selected to serve as deacons. You know what's pretty unique about these, these seven men that were chosen? They all have Greek names, right? They don't have Hebrew names, but the church as a whole, they were concerned about the Hellenistic widows. They were concerned about the complaint that arose, you know? Um, maybe they were just overlooked. Maybe it was not on purpose, but they saw it and they said, okay, we're going to select seven men to serve, and we know there will be seven men that love and will serve. These seven men brought about and maintained that unity and harmony. They were specifically commissioned by the church as leaders and servants. We see that as, as in, in verse 6. It says, These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. All right, so they were specifically called and entrusted with the ministry of serving. This plan of shared ministry is biblical. Right? I've, I've talked to some pastors who um, you know, don't have shared ministry. Uh, I've talked to churches whose pastor doesn't share in the ministry that the church does. But that's not a biblical model. A biblical model is where God brings a pastor and a church together, prioritizing the gospel, and ministry takes place. As that happens, you know what? The early church honored God and the result was clear. We see that in verse 7. The word of God continued to increase. So there was a problem. There were some fractures that were trying to start to creep in. But as they addressed it and were wise in the way that they did, it says the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Wait, what? Priests? Who were steeped in Jewish tradition and everything else? Yeah, that's got to be an act of God. Alright, so, so God's power is on display in confronting and dealing with this issue and this problem that the early church had. Because it's a solution that only God could bring about. So as we think about this text, as we think about potential conflict or complaining or uh, you know, fissures within the church, fractures, uh, attacks on unity or harmony. As we think about sharing ministry, as we think about prioritizing the gospel, yes, still caring for others, but loving God first and then loving our neighbor as ourselves. I want to give you a couple of specific challenges this morning. All right, we've all been in church long enough to know that complaining happens. Right? When complaining happens, I encourage you, don't let your ears be a trash can for others' complaints. All right? Because that's really what it is. When you hear complaining or you're aware of it, you can do it in love, but you can say, hey, have you talked to her about that? Or have you talked to him about that? You know, have, have, have y'all prayed together about that? Okay, instead of complaining and, and inserting strife and division, encourage for yourselves and others to keep your eyes on God, not on yourself. Because when we have our eyes on ourselves, that's the root of grumbling. The next thing I want to challenge you with is to share in ministry. You may think and say, well, what do you mean share in ministry? I come to church on Sundays and you know, uh, I attend the Sunday school class, and well, I'll go ahead and tell you the early church. The people didn't join the early church just to sit and soak. Right? God did not save you through the blood of Jesus Christ to sit and soak on a pew. But God called you to serve. You know how I know that without question? Because when we come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And the Holy Spirit equips and gifts each one of us with a spiritual gift to be able to build up and edify the body. Okay? Uh, Paul's writings talk about it a lot. I just want to encourage you to find a place to serve. Use the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you to serve others. You may say, well, I have no idea. I don't know what I could do 
A lot of times we make excuses and we say, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't sing in the choir, my voice is... And we come up with a bucket list of excuses. All right? Believe me, singing in the choir is not for everybody. All right? I try to sing really low when I'm back there. And I've told the ladies that are ever in front of me in practice, I'm like, hey, if I'm just really bad, turn around and tell me and I'll be quiet. All right? But we're all gifted in different ways. If you think or say, well, you know, I'm not really sure how I'm gifted or I don't know how I could serve. Here is your invitation. If that's where you find yourself, I want to take you to breakfast or to lunch or to a cup of coffee. I want to pray with you and I want to talk to you because I know without, without a doubt that we are all members of the body that God equips and gifts to build the body up, to provide unity, to benefit the body, to make an impact in others' lives. Then lastly, I want to challenge you to prioritize sharing the gospel in prayer. How many times in your lifetime have you shared the gospel with somebody else? Look, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty because guilt does no good. Right? Guilt is from the enemy. Right? But I think sometimes we just need an honest assessment. Right? How many times have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? Right? Not judgmental at all. How much time do you spend in prayer? Praying for those who are lost. Praying for our church. Praying for the advancement of the gospel around the world. Right? Because that's what the apostles have, have modeled right here. That that's the priority. The advancement of the gospel. And then the power and, and communion with God through prayer. When we do these things. All right? When we don't complain, when we confront complaining, when we go to a biblical model to address issues without dismissing them, all right? when we keep the main priority the main priority, when we share in ministry together with the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us, and our priority is on the gospel, we'll be able to sit back and watch what's going on. Did you, did you catch that in this text? After this plan was put in place and the ministry was shared, it says in the Word of God, continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Bethel, I pray that this is what we would be about. That we would prioritize it. That we would be able to see disciples multiply in Stanley County. That we would be able to see disciples multiply in North Carolina, in the United States, and around the world. God desires to be big and use us. Got to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. That's making the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to have a time of, of commitment. I don't know that we'll sing. If you would just play, uh, that would be great. Uh, I don't know how the, the Holy Spirit has, has spoken to you. You know, maybe uh, maybe you need to ask God to forgive you for, for having a complaining spirit. I find myself doing that far too often. But remember, the root is when I take my eyes off of God, put them on myself. Maybe this morning, you know, God has just really challenged you. Hey, you know, I mean, I love the Lord and I love the church, but I need to serve somewhere. You know, this, this text is a great example. You know, uh, I, I need to be more intentional in service. I don't know how the Holy Spirit is spoken. But as He does, the important thing is for us to respond. Right? To, to admit back to God what He has shown us through His Word. Uh, to do our business with Him. So... So when you get ready to have this time of invitation, let me pray before we start.
God, I thank you so very much for your word. I thank you for this model of dealing with conflict, of dealing with issues within the church. God, I pray that you would help us to uh, be biblical in all that we do and all that we say here at Bethel, that it wouldn't be based on uh, what we think is right, but that, God, we would go to your word. Because we know that your word is never wrong. God, I pray for my friends, my brothers and sisters here today. And just ask, Spirit, you speak to them, to their hearts and lives. Challenge, convict, bring correction, repentance where it's needed, encouragement where it is needed. God, I pray that here at Bethel, we would be about the business of advancing the gospel, of loving and serving others, and keeping the main thing the main thing. God, through that, we desire to glorify you and we ask that you would change hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.